conditions and what, what, it, what would trigger an abort and how tightly you have to be in that volume window to proceed. Um, what, are real, what details would give me? Well, Let me start with the abort part of the question. Um, all, all the aborts the vehicle does look the same. They have the same magnitude. So it's, it's very simplistic in terms of the type of burn and what the vehicle is trying to do. Um, in terms of criteria for an abort, there are a number of different criteria. If uh, the vehicle suffered two system failures in a common system, for example, so if, if I had two propulsion strings that went down, in that case I've still got a third string, but that's my only remaining string, the vehicle would automatically do an abort. So the overall philosophy is that at any point that I get down to zero fault tolerance for a certain given critical system, the vehicle will automatically do an abort. I think your other question you were kind of asking about maybe the control range, and that's, it's a pretty large range, but as the vehicle is approaching from under ISS, it does kind of have a pre-programmed in range, so it understands where it is and where it should be. If for some reason it suffers enough failures and it's got to take a handful of failures before it could even get outside of that range, it has other system checks that would cause it to abort. And when you're coming up the R bar um, and if an abort happens at any point in that, that regime, where does the vehicle go? Does it go down? Does it go back, forward, or what happens? While it's on the R bar, the vehicle would go out in front and then up and over ISS. Around, I mean, right. Okay. It looked very similar to that. When it's further away, before it's reached the R bar, it would just it would burn and go further down below us and just go out in front. And for Mike, um, given the uh, uh, the amount of logistics on board, I mean, I assume it's fairly critical that this thing gets there and delivers those supplies. If for whatever reason it didn't make it, does that have any long-term impact? I mean, other than the, the loss, which obviously everybody would regret, but does it have any impact on station ops? You know, we've been working <clears throat> the short term. Uh, logistics relative to keeping six crew on orbit and it had a combination of uh, both the 17A mission that's docked now and the HTV. So with 17A we've gotten a little relief on the near-term uh, logistics but but this is logistics that's required and if, if for some reason this vehicle doesn't make it we'll have to make them up on future flights. We can do that but it'll affect other uh, research or other items we want to get to orbit. So now that 17A is here it's not um, it's not time critical, uh, but it is mission critical because if it doesn't make it, we'll have to, we'll have to instead of flying food and logistics on the subsequent vehicles, we now have to replace that with the, um, I'm, start, I'm sorry, instead of flying some of the other items or our user payloads we were planning on flying on future flights, we'd have to put in the food and logistics that's on this HTV vehicle. Thanks, and then two more quick ones if I can. Um, uh, they're doing HTV training on the station today, but between now and then, do they actually have a simulator? I mean, do they see an HTV in a computer display and then fly the arm and imaginarily, if you will, as a video game or something? They do. They have, um, it, it, we call it robot. That's the name of the simulator that they have on board. But it basically gives the capability to do both the monitoring as the vehicle's approaching up the R bar, and then also we've got a hand controller. That's kind of like a, a video game as you referred to it. And that allows them to practice, practice the track and capture. And the crew can select different initial conditions, different r rates that the vehicle's moving. So they kind of have different initial uh, test cases they can run through. Thanks. My last question is for uh, Mr. Miyake. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Is there a cost associated with this? I mean, is there a figure you guys use for what this mission cost? Okay, uh, the way HTV-1, uh, it's a demonstration launch and uh, the manufacturing, uh, the cost is the uh, $200 million. And, uh, the spacecraft and rocket. Uh, just HTV, the, uh, the uh, uh, visiting vehicle itself. The uh, total, the uh, uh, launch, uh, launch and uh, total, the uh, Cost the the uh, uh, three. Oh. Let me see. Oh. All the development the cost for the HTV one is the six hundred eighty million dollar. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com with a few questions um, for Dana. Uh, actually, this question is for Space.com. Um, uh, how many crew hours are needed in terms of transfer activities um, once it's docked and, and berthed? For the pressurized cargo transfer, we estimate it's going to take about 70 total crew hours to transfer it. Um, 
that number, depending upon how much we put back inside it, how much waste cargo, that number could vary a little. But with what we're looking at today, that's the number. And then, of course, the unpressurized cargo transfer, you know, it involves a lot of robotics. That's done across the span of three days. And uh, for Mr. Miyake, uh, is JAXA planning to name the spacecraft after it launches? Uh, and is it carrying any commemorative uh, or cultural items on board in addition to its uh, payload? Uh, right now, the, we have no plan to name, uh, like a keyboard. <laughs> I hope there's some good uh, name for each uh, flight, uh, but unfortunately, this time that uh, we have no uh, specific name for keyboard uh, HCV1. And, and are there any cultural or commemorative items on board in addition to the to the supplies and and food aboard? I mean. Uh, 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 items that would celebrate the first launch of uh, of, uh, of HTV. Mm, there are no problem, but uh, usually the uh, any some memorial day like uh, for Koichi Wakata that we have the 100 the uh, stay on the boat uh, for his boat that we celebrate celebrate with the our ground team. So the kind of the uh, this is actually the international cooperation now. So, so exciting, then uh, when we uh, completed the bus end of the HEV, we like to share the, all the uh, uh, appreciation or some exciting moment with the DNA team and the Canadian team. So I'm not sure exactly what we should, but maybe we have some something. <laughs> And, for, and, and lastly, for space.com, uh, again, for Mr. Miyake, uh, what does the HTV in the larger sense mean uh, for Japan? Does this lead potentially to a manned spacecraft in the future? Or, or what are the, the options for advancing HTV beyond a supplier? Yes, uh, actually, we have no specific plan at this moment, but we will keep, uh, maintain this HT, HTV uh, capability for the future, uh, our manned space program, uh, using this uh, H-2B launch vehicle. So the uh, many some options will be existing, but we didn't decide yet exact how to proceed those our own checks uh, manned space uh, activity. Just we are using this uh, HTV uh, technology and also the uh, keyboard technology that we will, uh, we will, in the future, that we like to have some uh, on the human space program. So the H-2B launch vehicle is one of the key function to uh, accomplish those, the, our own uh, human space program. But at this time, the, we have no exact plan for that, our own human space program uh, activity. Next, we'll take questions from NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, can you, this is uh, Stephen Clark, by the way, with Space Flight Now. Um, can you describe the decision-making process uh, uh, both after the far field demonstrations and also with the rendezvous demonstrations? Uh, do you have an MMT, or is it just, uh, do you have success criteria defined before you give the go-ahead to uh, press on? It's a combination. Um, for the far field demonstrations that I was talking about on flight day three, we'll have a special IMMT meeting on flight day six to review all of that data and look at the vehicle's performance. On the actual uh, rendezvous and capture day, flight day eight, there are a handful of additional demonstrations that we'll be doing, and we have very specific success criteria associated with those. So that'll be evaluated in real time. Uh, in addition to that, there are what we call these go-no-go no go kind of gates that, that we have to have certain system configurations and system performance criteria that we meet before we pass these certain gates. So we do a number of checkpoints and polls of the team as we progress closer and closer to ISS. And the final poll is actually taken right at the capture point before we give the crew a go for HTV's capture. Okay, I just have a couple more. Um, uh, you know, this is a, a big first for the space station program, and, and as you alluded to, this 
will be how the COTS and CRS vehicles also arrive. Uh, but the free-flying grapple, I know you did it with the shuttle 